Hello, my name is Dr. Virginia Von Schaefer. <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about uh, Epstein-Barr as an oncogenic virus. I know from everyone's response to our videos that we've uh, presented about Epstein-Barr and HPV and uh, different viruses that there's a great amount of interest, of course, because many people have these problems. Now, <clears throat> when you seek help from a traditional doctor, most often, if you do test positive for Epstein-Barr or have acute mono, as they call it, uh, you may be feeling tired or weak uh, and just not yourself. <clears throat> and of course, when you go to the doctor and to ask uh, what can be done, basically you're told, we're told, I've been told myself, that it's just going to go away. Don't worry about it. Well, yes and no. Now, there are many people who contract Epstein-Barr virus and are asymptomatic, just as there are many people who get sick when they have the infection. However, the most difficult part is that if you have no symptoms and you're not aware of a problem, you won't come to diagnosis, number one. And number two, even if you come to diagnosis, there is no treatment offered, primarily because there are no specific antiviral agents that are successfully used to treat and eradicate Epstein-Barr virus. Unlike herpes virus, where we have um, <clears throat> acyclovir, valcyclovir, a number of uh, medications, antivirals that are used uh, pretty successfully, at least to suppress outbreaks. When it comes to Epstein-Barr, there isn't anything available. Now, <clears throat> the reason I wanted to focus on this is because there is a huge epidemic and uh, outbreak, as it were, of aggressive cancers in young people under the age of 35 years. In fact, there has been a lot of uh, scrutiny of the population of young males who are coming to diagnosis sometimes at a late stage, stage four cancer in uh, colon cancer, and there are no known or observable genetic causes for this to happen. And I noticed once I started looking at patients differently in terms of evaluating them and aggressively treating them for viruses, I saw that people's cancers went away quicker. And it made me really stop and think about the contribution that Epstein-Barr can make in terms of uh, promoting and definitely perpetuating cancer. Now, we have history of uh, people who have looked into this problem for patients with lymphomas and sometimes leukemias. There's a lymphoma that was named after a doctor who uh, discovered uh, that Epstein-Barr was the source of Burkitt's, now we call lymphoma. Uh, and the research that was done was very detailed in terms of understanding where the virus transfected into the patient's DNA and how it altered the patient's uh, genetic make makeup and, and caused uh, cancer. However, after all this work done on this one particular type of lymphoma, it seems as though no one continued any interest. And I'm hoping that at some point, people will kind of pick up the ball again and do have a closer look at what Epstein-Barr really does to your cells. Now, there is literature to show that Epstein-Barr virus is oncogenic in a very primary way, and that the microRNA of the virus that resides in the cytoplasm and signals uh, activity that should be turned on or turned off in the nucleus of the cell uh, that Epstein-Barr virus causes a block on normal apoptosis or cell death in cells that are older or sick and need to die. 
Now, the cell regulatory mechanisms are very detailed, and uh, this is a kind of an override in the natural process that is in place to help us eliminate uh, cells that are old and sick. So if you perpetuate the life of a cell that's sick, it's going to be more likely to cause problems and have a chance to develop into uh, abnormal um, characteristics and behaviors, namely cancer. Now, we also know from research that was uh, done in Japan quite a long time ago, 2010, that <clears throat> they studied macrophages, or primary cells that help kill either unwanted entities or cells that are sick and have to die, a macrophage can do this all on their own. They can identify this problem cell, engulf it, digest it, and it's gone. It's dead. However, sometimes the vacuoles are not digested properly, and sometimes an unwanted entity, such as a virus, can live inside the macrophage. So the Japanese researchers looked at Epstein-Barr infected macrophages and their behavior in cancer. And they discovered and demonstrated with immunofluorescence techniques that these Epstein-Barr infected macrophages, when they would go in to kill or clean up, quote unquote, a tumor, in fact, they would release oncogenic proteins that made the tumor grow more. I personally have seen this happen in patients with cancer. I had a patient who had bilateral breast cancer, and both sides of both breasts had different cancers or cell types. She had known a severe case of Epstein-Barr virus, but she went to a kind of alternative clinic where they like to use a lot of um, macrophage activating um, GC MAF, as it were, uh, substances. This woman had one month of GC MAF uh, activation treatment, and her tumors more than doubled in size because of the untreated and sick macrophages that were activated in this treatment, unbeknownst to uh, the people who were administering it to her. <clears throat> Although I don't have a research paper that can point to this at this time, work is ongoing to f try and understand exactly what the role is between Epstein-Barr virus and cancer. However, in my clinical experience, I see that there's very clearly a correlation. And people who get better and stay better and avoid recurrences are the people who have their viruses diagnosed, fully treated, and eradicated. Thank you.